Well, uh, ever since I was a graduate student, I have been an admirer of the work of uh, Bill Tutt, so I'm very happy to have this chance to help celebrate the 100th anniversary of his birth. And I'm going to talk about this connection between uh, linear algebra and combinatorics, a uh, Smith normal form of certain uh, matrices and the combinatorial significance of this. So let me first uh, define Smith normal form. Well, it can easily be done for rectangular matrices, but for simplicity, let's just consider square matrices. So we'll say that uh, n by n matrix A over a commutative ring with identity um, has a Smith normal form. Uh, B, if we can find two matrices P and Q, uh, well, in GLNR, that means they're n by n matrices with coefficients in this ring R, and they're invertible over R. So their determinants are units in R. And we want uh, PAQ to be a diagonal matrix such that each entry on the diagonal divides the next one. So we call this a, a, such a matrix B a Smith normal form of A. Okay, so the natural question to ask is when does it exist and how unique is it? Um, well, as I said, for, well, I mentioned before, we could do it for rectangular matrices. And also notice if we take the determinants uh, on both sides here, we'll get the determinant of A, well, the de determinants of P and Q are units, so a unit times the determinant of A is the product of these diagonal elements. So we get this refinement of the determinant of A, the kind of factorization induced by the Smith normal form. So, you know, in combinatorics, there's many interesting determinants that arise, and a lot of them factor nicely, and so it's an interesting question to figure out their uh, Smith normal form and whether that might have some further combinatorial significance. So another way of uh, thinking about Smith normal form is um, we can put a matrix into Smith normal form by certain row and column operations, add a multiple of a row to another row, a multiple of a column to another column, or multiply a row or a column by a, a unit in R. We're not allowed to multiply by non-units. So uh, this is equivalent to this multiplying on the left by P and the right by Q, doing a sequence of these operations. So, for instance, over a field, Smith normal form is just row reduced echelon form. And, uh, oops, the, uh, oops, the uh, diagonal would just have unit entries because every non zero element, well, unit entries and zeros because every non zero element is a unit of a field. So uh, we just have the row reduced echelon form of the ones and zeros on the diagonal. The number of ones is the rank of the matrix. So a Smith normal form is some kind of refinement of this theory of row reduced echelon form for rings when, when the entries come from some ring. Okay, so the most basic theorem on the existence of SNF is that over a principal ideal ring, or PIR, so this is a ring for which every ideal is principal or has one generator. I don't assume it's an integral domain. So for instance, the integers modulo M are a principal ideal ring, but not a domain if M is not prime. Of course, the integers or polynomials in one variable over a field, these are PIRs. And then it's known uh, that uh, over such a ring, a matrix has a unique Smith normal form up to units. So these are mainly the rings we're interested in, especially for combinatorial purposes, the integers. And this basically goes back to uh, 
Smith. I mean, he did it over the integers, but his argument works for any PIR. So for other uh, rings, uh, some you know, random matrix is probably not going to have an SNF, but there's some interesting uh, examples where they do. Now, this is not really relevant to the combinatorics of my talk, but you know, an interesting question is exactly which rings are have the property that every matrix over R has an SNF. We know principal ideal rings are sufficient, but not necessary. And it's open to characterize these rings. A necessary condition is that it's R is what's known as a Bezu ring. Every finitely generated ideal is principal. So if R is Noetherian, that's every ideal is finitely generated, then SNF Having an SNF is equivalent, you know, for every matrix over R, is equivalent to being a principal ideal ring. But there are Bazou rings that are not Noetherian, like the ring of entire functions and the ring of all algebraic integers. And an example of an open problem in this area is uh, whether every matrix over a Bezu integral domain as an SNF, that is not known. They're not very relevant for the combinatorics. <laughs> now, there's a very uh, nice algebraic interp interpretation of SNF, which shows us you know, algebraically a natural concept. Let's just assume R is a PID, principal ideal domain. And A can be any n by n matrix over R with rows V1 uh, up to Vn. So these rows are elements of R to the n. And let's say this diagonal matrix with entries E1, E2 up to En is a Smith normal form of A, which it's going to be unique up to multiplication by units. Then, uh, well, it's not hard to prove that uh, if we look at the R module, R to the N, the free R module, R to the N, mod the rows, V1 up to Vn, these N rows of our matrix A. This is a, I mean, a finitely generated module over a uh, PID. If, you know, you remember your algebra, it's a direct sum of cyclic modules, modules with one generator. That is, R modulo some principal ideal. And the generators of these principal ideals are these uh, diagonal elements of the SNF. That's the algebraic interpretation. If we work over the integers, this, uh, you know, uh, there's a fundamental theorem for finitely generated abelian groups that we can write this quotient as a sum of cyclic groups, essentially. And we can do it uniquely if we insist that the order of each group divides the next. Okay. This uh, quotient, Rn modulo the rows, that's exactly what would be the co-kernel of A regarded as a linear operator. And so that's sometimes called the co-kernel or castelline co-kernel of our matrix A. Now, there's also an explicit formula for Smith normal form of a n by n matrix over a PID. Well, it's not, in general, it's not such an easy formula to work with, as you'll see uh, by the statement of it. But let's suppose we have this SNF with diagonal elements E1 up to EN. And then, uh, again, this is not hard to prove that the product of the First i of these e's, e1, e2 up to ei, is the GCD of the i by i minors of A. The greatest common divisor of all i by i minors in the ring R. And I remind you, by minor, I mean the determinant of a square submatrix. So for instance, when i equals 1, we see that e1, first entry here, is the GCD of all the entries. After that, it gets more complicated to compute. OK, so let's look at uh, some examples now of uh, 
matrices that arise in combinatorics and what we can say about their Smith normal forms. Well, uh, important matrix that you can associate with a finite graph G, the Laplacian matrix. The rows and columns are indexed by the vertices of G. And if U and V are vertices, the UV entry is uh, minus the number of edges between U and V if U is not equal to V. And on the diagonal, when U equals V, the degree of U. A very well-known uh, matrix associated with a graph. And uh, if we remove any, uh, if for any vertex V, if we remove from the Laplacian matrix the row and column indexed by V, we'll get the reduced Laplacian matrix, L0G. Well, it depends on this vertex V. But the famous uh, matrix tree theorem says that the determinant of the reduced Laplacian matrix is kappa G, the number of spanning trees of G. Sure, familiar to many people here. So, uh, one, that means that the Smith normal form of this reduced Laplacian matrix is going to give some kind of factorization of kappa G. And, you know, it could be an interesting graph theory question to understand what this factorization is. So, in general, I mean, there's no general theorem that tells you, uh, you know, analogous to the uh, matrix tree theorem that you can just read off the SNF of L0G. And uh, knowing that the SNF of L0G has some uh, nice applications to so-called sand pile models or chip firing on graphs, I'll quickly mention a connection soon. But uh, let's take an example first. This is the reduced Laplacian matrix of the complete graph K4. I mean, for K4, it doesn't matter which vertex you remove, you know, use to remove a row and column from the Laplacian matrix, you'll get the same reduced Laplacian. The number of spanning trees of uh, K4 is 16. So uh, this matrix has the determinant 16. So how... What's the SNF look like? It's some factorization of 16. And, you know, uh, we can do uh, row and column operations. This is random brute force computation of SNF. We start out with a matrix like here. I think I've subtracted the last column from the second and I've added three times the last column to the first. And you continue simplifying. Once we get to this one, we're essentially done because you can permute row and columns. That's an allowed uh, operation. And since SNF is only determined up to units, we can change this minus one to a one. So one, four, four is the SNF. So we have factored 16 as one times four times four. And what about the general, the you know, complete graph KN? The reduced Laplacian matrix is N times the identity matrix minus the all ones matrix. You know, it goes back to Borcher, that uh, number of spanning trees of the complete graph KN is N to the N minus 2. So what is the factorization given by the SNF? Well, here there's a nice trick to compute SNF. Um, the theorem is that the diagonal entries are just a 1 and n minus 2 n's. I said this is a refinement of Cayley's theorem. Well, it's, of, it's often called Cayley's theorem that the number of spanning trees is n to the n minus 2, although it actually goes back a little, a little earlier than that. So how can we prove... Uh, the complete graph of the reduced Laplacian matrix has this SNF1 and NN. Well, we just use the fact that the 
two by two submatrices of this reduced, reduced Laplacian have one of these three forms up to row and column operations. Easy to check. And the determinants of these three matrices are n times n minus 2, minus n, and 0. And uh, the GCD of the 2 by 2 minors is E1 times E2. So well, the GCD of these numbers, n, n minus 2, n, and 0, is n. So E1 times E2 is n. And each EI divides the next one. And the product of all the EIs is the determinant, n to the n minus 2. That, oops, that forces uh, this SNF to look like this. Now I can say a quick word about the connection between chip firing and uh, Smith normal form. Um, so let's call an abelian sand pile a finite collection of, say, sigma chips that we put on the vertices of our finite connected graph. So we think of this sigma as some function from the vertices to the non-negative integers. Sigma of a vertex is the number of chips on the vertex. And then we can talk about toppling a vertex V. If it, the number of chips at that vertex is greater than or equal to the degree V, then we can send a chip from V to each of its neighbors. So like here, I've uh, toppled at this, you can see this circled vertex here, with, it has five chips. So we send one to here, one to here, and one to here, and we're left with two chips here. So that's the operation of toppling. And uh, we can define a certain uh, group associated with uh, this concept, the sand pile group. First, we choose a vertex to be a sink. And uh, whenever a chip goes into the sink, it just disappears. And we can define a configuration to be stable if no vertex can topple. So at every vertex, there are fewer chips than its degree. An easy theorem is, after finitely many topples, when we, when we have this sink, you know, I'm assuming the graph is connected, a stable configuration will be reached. We uh, keep on losing vertices uh, chips into the sink until finally we don't have uh, enough vertices, uh, enough chips at any vertex to topple. And uh, this configuration is independent of the order of the topples. That's why this is called the, the Abelian sand pile model because of the independence of the order of topples. Okay. Well, so a stable configuration is one that we cannot topple. And we can make them into a monoid, a commutative monoid, that is, a commutative semigroup with identity by just adding them vertex-wise and uh, then stabilizing. So this defines a certain uh, monoid on the set of stable configurations. And in general, uh, ideal of a monoid is some subset J of M, <coughs> such that sigma J is contained in J for all sigma in M. You know, exact analog of the ideal of a ring. And it's a nice exercise to show that uh, if you have a finite commutative monoid, the unique, there's a, there exists a unique minimal ideal, and it's a group. And it turns out that um, for uh, um, the sand pile, so we call this group the sand pile group of G, the unique minimal ideal KG of this monoid M of stable configurations. And the, one can show it's independent of the choice of sink up to isomorphism, this, this uh, group. 
And the main theorem is that it's just the co-kernel of the reduced Laplacian matrix. It's a, I mean, it's a finite abelian group. So it's a direct sum of cyclic groups, and the orders of those cyclic groups are the diagonal elements of the SNF. Well, this is just the, the beginning of this very elaborate uh, subject of uh, sand pile groups and connections with uh, Smith normal form, but that gives you some idea that there's nice connections there. Some nice combinatorics behind this uh, Smith normal form. Well, uh, I'll come back to some further examples soon, but let's look at a different aspect of SNF. What can you say about the Smith normal form of a random matrix? So you might know there's this huge literature on random matrices, uh, mostly connected with eigenvalues and eigenvectors of these matrices. Um, but there's not so much work that has been done on say, a random matrix over a PID, what does its SNF look like? So let me give one simple sample result that shows that this could be an interesting question. So I'll only look at this one uh, random matrix model here. Well, we're only going to work over the integers. Mat K of N will be all N by N integer matrices whose entries are from minus K to K. Uh, K is some positive integer with a uniform distribution between minus K and K. So we choose each entry of our matrix uniformly from minus K to K. And you know, then we're going to be interested in what happens as K goes to infinity. So let's just ask um, if let PK of ND be the probability that we take a matrix M from this model random matrix M, and compute its SNF, E1 up to EN, then E1 is D, some number D. So we're just interested here in the first entry, E1. Well, E1 was the GCD of all the entries. So we're simply asking if we have N squared integers, you know, chosen from minus K to K, what is the uh, probability that they're uh, GCD is D. And we're interested in the situation as K goes to infinity. Now, this is a standard result from elementary number theory that it's uh, uh, proportional to, well, it was 1 over D to the N squared, and then this normalization uh, constant 1 over the Riemann zeta function of N squared. So for instance, if D is 1, the probability that all the entries are relatively prime is 1 over zeta of n squared. You know, standard result from elementary number theory, the probability that n squared numbers are relatively prime. OK, so it seems like it might be interesting, given this result, to look at other values of the SNF other than E1. OK, so this is some joint work with um, Inkwe Wan, or more accurately spelling her name this way. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is the setup. Um, well, first there's some general results um, about existence of these probabilities. Suppose we specify positive integers alpha 1 up to alpha n minus 1, such that alpha i divides alpha i plus 1. We want these to be the first n minus 1 entries of our SNF of an n by n matrix. So mu k of n is the probability that the SNF of a random matrix you know, from this model uh, satisfies ei equals alpha i, alpha i between 1 and n minus 1. And then mu n is the limit as k goes to infinity. It's something like a random integer matrix when we let k go to infinity. Then uh, this limit exists and is strictly between 0 and 1. So it's some non-trivial number that could be interesting to compute. 
Notice we're not specifying alpha n, the last entry of the SNF. That behaves completely differently. Um, if we specify alpha n, then the, look at the probability that the SNF of a random matrix in mat k of n satisfies E n equals alpha n, then as k goes to infinity, this limit is zero. OK, so what about then oh, in this nice case, when this limit is more interesting, what is it? So I'll give us, we have you know, a general theorem that gives the exact answer to this question. And the statement is a little complicated, so I'll just illustrate it in one special case. Um, when E1 is 2 and E2 is 6, say. So we have this n by n matrix. What's the probability that in the SNF, E1 is 2 and E2 is 6 as k goes to infinity when we choose these entries between minus k and k? We'll call that mu of n. And uh, here is the formula for mu of n. It, has, it always has a form. It's a product over all primes. I mean, part of the proof, which is not so easy, is to show that we can look at each prime separately. Um, the primes 2 and 3 are special because uh, they divide E1 and E2. Uh, but for the, prime, the good primes that don't involve E1 and E2, this is the product. Product of all primes greater than 3, and then some special products for 2 and 3. So that's a general form of the result. And there are some interesting uh, special cases of this. What's the probability that an n by n integer matrix has a SNF where the first n minus 1 entries are 1? This is a saying that it has a cyclic co-kernel, because the co-kernel is the direct sum of cyclic groups of orders e1, e2, up to en minus 1. So the co-kernel would just be of order en, a cyclic group of order en. So the probability of a cyclic co-kernel. Well, actually, this is one of the few results that was known earlier. It was due to Torch and Ekedal in 1991. It's given by this explicit formula, which you know, it's a special case of the more general results of myself and Inquei Wong. Um, when you, you can let n go to infinity here, as the matrix gets larger and larger, what's the probability that the co-kernel is cyclic? And this limit, uh, one can prove, is this product, 1 over zeta of 6 times the product j greater than or equal to 4 zeta of j, about 85%, about 85% chance of a cyclic co-kernel, which I would have guessed, you know, without knowing this, that the probability would be 1, because uh, you're asking, it's the same as saying that the n minus 1 by n minus 1 minors are relatively prime. It's equivalent to that. This n squared, n minus 1 by n minus 1 minus, the probability that n squared numbers are relatively prime as n goes to infinity is 1. Uh, but the, these minors are not independent. So, I, I, I mean, the probability that it, the GCD of n minus 1 squared independent numbers were is relatively prime as 1, but these minors are massively dependent. And it reduces the probability to 85%. So that's the probability that the number of generators G of the co-kernel is 1. What about um, other number of generators? Well, the probability that G equals 2, there's a product formula for that. It's, it's going to 1 very rapidly. You know, over 99% chance there's at most two generators. At most three generators, you know, this 0.9999 uh, probability is a probability. And in fact, asymptotically, 
uh, the probability that we have less than or equal to L generators is 1 minus some constant well, times 2 to the minus L plus 1 squared. It's, so it's going to 1 you know, quadratically exponentially. That's why it's very fast convergence to 1. Does anybody recognize this constant, <coughs> constant 3.46275? It's this <laughs> infinite product. <laughs> and not very many people uh, <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> okay, so let's um, look at some uh, examples of uh, computing uh, SNFs of matrices that arise in combinatorics. So here is an interesting uh, example. Even the determinant is quite interesting. Um, so uh, we we'll start with a partition lambda, a weakly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers uh, with a finite sum, such as 3, 1, and then zeros. And we can identify this partition with its Young diagram like this, three squares in the first row and one in the second. Uh, lambda star will be the partition we get by extending this diagram by putting a strip of squares around it like this. So this is three ones star. It's actually the partition four, four, two. And now what we want to do is insert integers into these squares uh, recursively. So we start out by uh, putting ones into the squares that we added around the boundary. The, these green squares. And the property we want, now we're going to put squares, uh, numbers in these squares and work our way away from the boundary towards this upper left hand corner such that every square matrix, sub matrix of this array whose uh, lower right hand entry is on the boundary, the determinant of that matrix should be 1. Range condition. So let's let me state that again. Uh, if T is any square of our diagram, T and lambda, MT is the largest square of the extended diagram with T as the upper left hand corner. So here's our extended diagram. This is a square T, and so this would be MT, biggest square for which this is the upper left hand corner. And uh, we want to insert numbers into these squares so that the determinant of all these matrices, MT, is 1. So let's do it for this example. This is where lambda is 3, 1. I've normalized it by the, putting these 1s here. So first we put in a number here. That's this 2 by 2 matrix should have determinant 1. Right? So that gets that gets a, a 2. And then we could try this square, this 2 by 2 matrix. So that would be another 2. Then this 2 by 2 matrix. That has to be a 3. And then another 2 by 2 matrix, a 5. And finally, a 3 by 3 matrix. And you can check that the number you need to put here to make the determinant 1 is uh, 9. Now, it's easy to see that there's a unique way to do this. And these entries will always be integers. Because uh, if, we, you know, if we call this entry x, which we're trying to figure out what it should be, uh, so the determinant is 1, well, if we expanded this by the first row, the coefficient of x would be the, this determinant here, which has already been set equal to 1. So we get a linear equation in x with coefficient of x is 1, so x is some integer, uni uniquely determined integer. That's what it says here. Okay, now what is this integer? Well, it has a very elegant combinatorial interpretation. 
Um, for any square of our diagram, lambda t consists of all the squares of lambda in, to the southeast of t. So for instance, if this is t, and now I'm just looking in the, the diagram of lambda, not the extended diagram, uh, here's lambda of t. It's sort of the biggest subdiagram for which, uh, oops, for which t is the uh, upper left-hand corner. And for any partition mu lambda, uh, uh, any partition lambda, u sub lambda is the number of partitions mu whose diagram fits inside of the diagram of lambda. So, for instance, when lambda is 2, 1, these are the five diagrams that fit inside 2, 1. 2, 1 itself, 2, 1, 1, 1, and empty. So 5, mu of 2, 1 is 5. Um, you can write down a determinantal formula for u lambda, which goes back to McMahon and independently Creveross, but it's not needed for what I'm going to discuss. So um, this problem of uh, filling in these squares where all these determinants are one, this goes back to Burlakamp, who really only was interested in it mod 2. He wanted to know these numbers nt mod 2 in connection with some coding theory problem. And Carlos Rosell and Scoville then gave this combinatorial interpretation for nt uh, over the integers. Uh, namely, well, they didn't quite state it this way, but equivalently, nt is u lambda t. The number that we put in the square t is a number of partitions that fit into this sub-diagram, upper left-hand corner t. Now, there's two ways to prove this. The kind of a naive proof by induction using just row and column operations, and uh, also the gessel viennot theory of non-intersecting lattice path interpretations of determinants that can also be used very elegantly to solve this problem. But let's illustrate the statement of it. So here is my partition is 3, 1. Here is the extended diagram, and I have filled in all the entries so that the, these determinants are 1. Uh, why is this a 7? Well, the biggest subdiagram of our original partition, well, with this as the upper left-hand corner, is just the whole partition itself, 3, 1. And 3, 1 has seven diagrams that fit into it. So this is a 7. OK. Well, these. These matrices uh, whose determinants are 1 are not very interesting from the point of view of Smith normal form because the Smith normal form just has to be all 1s. You know, it gives some factorization over the integers of 1. However, uh, there's a Q analog uh, that uh, is more interesting from the point of view of SNF. Rather than uh, letting each uh, mu contained in lambda, just counting it once, when well, counting the number of diagrams that fit in lambda, were weighted by q to the number of squares of lambda that are not in mu. So for instance, here's my, this big diagram is my partition lambda, 6, 4, 4, 3, 1. Mu is sub diagram 4, 2, 1, 1. There's eight squares here, the green ones that are not in lambda. So we're going to weight this mu by q to the eighth. And then we'll define u lambda q to be the sum over all mu contained in lambda q to this weight, q to the size, number of squares of lambda slash mu. So like if uh, mu is 2, 1, there's five diagrams that fit inside everything, 2, 1, 1, 1, and empty. 
The leftover squares, there's no leftover squares here. One, one green square here, two Q, Q squared and Q cubed. So we've given this Q analog of U lambda. If we put Q equal to one, we just get the U lambda, the number of diagrams that fit in uh, lambda. Okay, now I need to define uh, the, the diagonal hooks of my shape lambda. Um, should be clear from this uh, diagram. Uh, first diagonal hook is the everything in the first row and column. Remove it and continue. So the first diagonal, diagonal hook number D1 is nine, nine squares. Then three, four squares in the second diagonal hook, and then one, and then zero for the remaining diagonal hooks. And the main result uh, about the Q analog of these uh, matrices that go back to Berlecamp is that if we, uh, if, 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 if in our matrix uh, MT, if we look at this Q analog, where instead of putting U lambda, we put U lambda Q, then uh, the matrix, you know, so the, the, we'll have a Smith normal form over the polynomial ring Z bracket Q, which is not a principal ideal domain, so even the existence of SNF is not clear immediately. Um, and moreover, if this matrix MT is a K plus one by K plus one matrix, then the SNF entries are just certain powers of Q, the partial sums of these diagonal hook sizes. So if we put Q equal to one, we're gonna specialize to the previous, well, matrix. Of course, this SNF will just be all ones in that case. So uh, in particular, the determinant of this weighted Q analog matrix would be the product of these entries here, Q to the sum of the I di. And in fact, uh, we have, uh, Christine Bessonrot and I have a multivariate generalization where you put in many variables, not just Q. But uh, for simplicity, I just stated it with Q. So let's look at an example to understand what this theorem is saying. Uh, my partition is six, four, three, one. Uh, these green dots are the extended diagram. The diagonal hooks are, are of size nine, four, and one of the original partition. So what number goes into this square, uh, so the number that goes into this square T was this weighted sum, you know, over all partitions that fit into six, four, three, one. And the SNF of this matrix, of this four by four matrix of these weighted sums is one Q, and one plus four is five, Q to the fifth, and one plus four plus nine, Q to the 14th. A special case, an interesting special case is the staircase partition. That is the partition with parts N minus one, N minus two, down to one. So here, here's an example uh, where N is well, four. So the partition is three, two, one, and in dotted lines are the is the extended part. Here is a partition mu 211 that are contained in the staircase, and the green squares are the leftover squares. I can think of this by drawing this lattice path from this corner to this corner that, uh, well, our definition should be clear should uh, be as just above the green lines. It should have mu, uh, the partition mu, above the lattice path. This is a, a rotated dick path. Uh, 
if you're familiar with Dick Bath, of length 2n, if the staircase is delta n. And uh, this number of green squares here is the, essentially the area under the Dick Path. This is a standard uh, QN log of Catalan numbers. The uh, enumerating Dick Paths by their area underneath them. And so uh, we get out, uh, well, here, here's an example for 2, 1, uh, n equals 3. We get this <coughs> Q Catalan number C, 3 of Q, Q, Q plus Q squared plus 2Q plus 1. We're getting uh, matrices of uh, whose entries are Q Catalan numbers because these partitions that you know fit, you know, if you have a staircase like this, and you take any square here and you look at everything uh, to the southeast of it, that's some other staircase. So always all these entries are going to be Q Catalan numbers. So we got this matrix of Q Catalan numbers, this Hangle matrix of Q Catalan numbers, and uh, we can compute the SNF, 1 Q, Q to the 6 uh, in this case. Um, these are alternating uh, triangular numbers, 4 choose 2, 2 choose 2, 0 choose 2. So um, this determinant of this Q Catalan number of Q Catalan matrix was known previously, but the SNF is new, and it's just a special case of this much more general result. By the way, the generating function for Q Catalan numbers, sum CN of Q x to the n, is this famous continued fraction that goes back to Ramanujan. It has some amazing properties. Okay, I think well, I think I'll skip this next um, application uh, or example, which uh, is a determinant that arises in the theory of symmetric functions. And instead, uh, let's look at uh, there's many open problems in this area because there are many interesting determinants in combinatorics uh, that factor a lot. And so the question arises of computing their SNF. And I'll just mention here one of the most interesting of these open problems, uh, which is a very special case of a much more general uh, setup. So let's suppose we have a uh, permutation, W, A1 up to AN. This is the symmetric group SN of all permutations of 1 up to N. L of W would be the length in the sense of Coxeter groups. Or that, that is the number of inversions of our permutation, the number of pairs that are out of order. So the number of i, j, such that i is less than j. Actually, this should be a i greater than a j. And v n is the uh, n by n factorial by n factorial matrix. It's rows and columns are indexed by permutations in Sn, and the uv entry is q to the number of inversions of u v inverse. So I use the letter v here because this is a special case of a much more general matrix due to Varchenko. So this is named after Varchenko. Uh, he defined a matrix of indeterminates associated with any arrangement of hyperplanes. And this corresponds to the braid arrangement of hyperplanes. Hyperplanes xi equals xj, where I've set all of these indeterminates equal to q. Very special case. And uh, here's an example for uh, n equals 3. We get this 6 by 6 matrix, Marchenko matrix. And this is its determinant. 
So um, one can also compute its uh, SNF of this uh, matrix. Um, oops. Yeah. Uh, these happen to be six diagonal entries. This is what they equal. It's not so clear what's going on here. So the determinant is known. It was first computed by Zagier in 1992. It's a product of 1 minus q to the j times j minus 1 to certain power. Um, Varchenko computed a you know, generalization of this for any one of his matrices associated with hyperplane arrangements. So this is a very special case now, Varchenko's theorem. But what about uh, SNF? That is open. Very interesting, interesting open problem is to find the SNF of this matrix or any Varchenko matrix specialized to all the variables equaling Q. The best, really the only significant partial result is due to Denham and Hanlon uh, about the SNF of this matrix VN, uh, namely um, how many times does Q minus 1 divide each entry? You know, the product of these diagonal elements is this product. So they all divide, you know, they're all cyclotomic polynomial products of cyclotomic polynomials. And so for every root of unity, we can ask for that cyclotomic polynomial, how many times does it divide each EI? So we can start out with one. And well, it's not hard to prove that uh, the SNF entries are actually polynomials in Q squared, not just Q. So uh, the number of EIs exactly divisible by Q minus 1 to the J, which is the same as the number divisible by Q squared minus 1 to the J, is a signless Stirling number of the first kind, C and N minus J, the number of permutations in Sn with n minus j cycles. A very elegant result. And uh, the next step would be cube roots of unity, or equivalently six roots of unity. Uh, how many times is each Ei divisible by a cyclic atomic polynomial of 1 plus q plus q squared? That's open. OK, well, uh, let's hope that gives you a little taste of some connections between uh, combinatorics and SNF. I've come to a very s sad but necessary part of my talk, the final slide, <laughs> which is the end. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the hidden uh, uh, Jacobi through this specialization that uh, you didn't have time to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go through this very quickly for the experts on symmetric functions. Uh, so here is the uh, Jacobi Trudy matrix. And um, if we set, uh, so it's determined as a sure function. And you know, if you specialize a sure function so that say, n variables equal to 1 and all the other ones equal to 0, that specialization factors in a very nice way. So the determinant, it, that's the same as factoring, specializing the entries hi to be the binomial coefficient n plus i minus 1 choose i. And so, yeah, so this, the determinant becomes this polynomial in n. So now we're going to look, we're going to be working over the field of rational numbers, of polynomials over the rationals, polynomials in N over the rationals. So the integer roots are zeros, these polynomials. And this result tells us exactly the Smith normal form. The integer roots are the contents, right, so-called contents of uh, 
my diagram, the sine distance from the main diagonal. And so uh, the Smith normal form is going to partition these contents up into various pieces, you know, the, it, the ones that go with each diagonal entry. And it's again, it's given by the uh, diagonal hooks. This, this product would be uh, the, the polynomial for which these contents are the zeros would be the last element of the SNF. Then this next one would be the next to last element of the SNF, et cetera. I don't, I, don't, it, I don't know why diagonal hooks appear here and in the previous problem I mentioned, which seems uh, very unrelated, but the same partitioning uh, of the SNF comes up by breaking up the part shape into diagonal hooks. So, so, so maybe there's a connection. Um, yeah, and the proof actually uses a little bit of machinery, like you need the Littlewood-Richardson rule uh, as an example to uh, prove this. Any further questions? Richard, Richard, you have a really nice evaluation of the, of the uh, matrix tree theorem for the number of spanning trees of the hypercube in your book. Yes. Do you know the, does, do you have a Smith normal form uh, explanation of, for that or, or, or for that Laplacian? No, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of work people have done on, you know, finding the Smith normal form of these Laplacian matrices. And I don't recall seeing that one, but it could be somewhere in the literature. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any further questions? All right, if not, then I'll just mention there's a reception in the room right across the hall, starting right now, and I'll present Dr. Stanley with a small gift to remember us by. Uh, let's thank him again. Oh, thank you.